Peter chapter 3, I want to share something with you that's hot off the press to my heart. And the Lord's continuing still speaking it to me very freshly, to even tonight again. I've spent some concentrated time in the Word of God around this truth. I want to speak this evening to you on the difference between harm and hurt. I don't know if you know there's a difference between harm and hurt, but you'll see it in the Bible as we spend a few moments in the Word of God tonight. I am so thankful for the good music and for the precious time in the presence of the Lord as we sang to Him Amen. and heard the, the musicians play. And of course, we, we, Brother Will's guitar skills are incredible and, and Brother Kit as well. I tell you, the two of them together, that was really, really beautiful. And I'm thankful for it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 13. And uh, keep your Bible in this book of the Bible open. Keep open to it. I'll refer you to some of the previous verses momentarily. But this is the thing that has really struck me. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Father, I pray in the name of Christ tonight you would quicken our hearts and open our understanding that we may see in the Word of God this tremendous truth. Lord, help us to know the difference. Help us recognize the assurance that we have that nothing can shake. All hell cannot shake it. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The difference in harm and hurt. So we have in verse 13 what is called a rhetorical question. A question is asked by the Holy Ghost through the pen of Peter, the answer of which is assumed to be so obvious that it doesn't have to be said out loud. The question is, and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Now that's very similar in kind to a series of questions that the Apostle Paul asked in Romans chapter 8. Now I'm going to turn there. I have my marker there so I can go quickly. And you may follow if you'd like to, to Romans the 8th chapter. But if you don't want to turn in your Bible to that text, listen as I read. These are familiar verses. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? And here begins a series of questions just like the one Peter just asked. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he begins to list possibilities. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution and so forth and so on. Those are familiar verses as I say. That series of questions that Paul asks. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Peter confined his question to this one verse in my text tonight. Who is he that shall harm thee if you be followers of that which is good? In both cases, in Romans 8 and in 1 Peter 3, the assumed answer considered by God to be so obvious that it ought not have to be said out loud is no one, that's who, no one shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. And in Peter's case, no one is able to harm you if ye be followers of that which is good. No person and no thing has the authority or the ability to harm you if you're seeking to be as right with God as you know how to be. That's the emphasized truth behind the question in verse 13. But now listen, as I say that to you this evening, you would agree, wouldn't you, that to the natural man, and I mean by that the man of flesh, the man of this world, the natural man does not view the answer to that question as obvious to the point that it doesn't have to be said or defended. In fact, on the natural level, the foundational truth of this text is what we would call counterintuitive. 
to the natural man, to the man outside of Christ, the man who is not spiritually minded. The answer, the, the, the assumed and obvious answer to Peter's question to the natural man and on the natural level, it defies what we assume to be the case on the basis not only of our own personal experience, but on the basis of natural observation. And the root of the problem, the reason that the answer to this question to some of us is not as obvious as the Spirit of God obviously thinks that it would be to us. Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? In our flesh we say, well, a lot of people harm me. People are harming me all the time. I'm experiencing harm from the devil and the world and, 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 and enemies. I, I experience it all the time. And the problem is, we don't know how to distinguish between the concepts of harm and hurt. So for the next little while, that very issue is going to be the focus of the message I'm bringing you from the Word of God, and I'm going to lay it out to you under two headings. First of all, the terminology needs to be defined. We need to clearly understand what the Word of God is talking about in this text, and to do that, we're going to, before we start talking about the word harm, we need to qualify the people that are being addressed in this text, and it falls under this statement, followers of that which is good. So let's consider that statement for a moment. This is the qualifying statement. You see, if you don't fall into that statement, if ye be followers of that which is good, if you don't fall into that statement, then there's a world of harm for you. So let's make sure that we fit in this statement, followers of that which is good. Now, there are obviously two hugely important words in this half of the verse, the first has to do with your heart intention, your heart inclination, and the second word has to do with the object that you're pursuing. So let's think about the two parts of that statement. First of all, if ye be followers, followers. The word literally is mimics, mimeti in the original language, which is the root for our English word mimic or imitator. And the word means this. In the original language, the word means someone who is seeking to copy or to put it better, to conform to a pattern or a standard of behavior that they believe to be noble and beautiful and godly and worthy. To imitate, to conform to. Ephesians 5, 1 uses the identical word when it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all them that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Followers of the Lord. You heard this morning, if you were in the morning service, a message from the word of God that talked about following Jehovah. If Jehovah is God, follow him, Elijah preached. And here tonight we see again the importance of this concept of following. When you, when you, when you look at this text in various translations, I find that the translators of more modern versions use words like this, zealous, devoted, enthusiastic, deeply committed. All of those terms are used by various translations in order to take this concept of mimeti, in mimic imitator, to take that from the Greek language into the English language, they lay hold of these kinds of terms. If ye be zealous for that which is good, if you be devoted, if you be enthusiastic, if you be deeply committed to that which is good. So what we're talking about tonight, in order to make sure that I fall under the umbrella of the promise of this verse, we're talking now about saved people who are surrendering themselves to the Lord as committed followers of Christ. This is about going all the way with Matthew chapter 11. Everyone loves the first part of Matthew 11's invitation verse. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Everybody loves the 28th verse, but that's not the end of the sentence. Jesus said, And take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. You see, to be a follower, to be a mimetide, to be a mimic, an imitator, someone seeking to copy and be conformed to the, the standard of the Lord, this is about not just taking 
uh, the, the, the offer of rest for my weary soul. This is about taking the yoke of Jesus on my life so that I can learn of him and I can learn how life ought to be lived by sitting at the feet of Jesus. Hosea 6 and verse 3 puts it like this, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. Somebody says, I know the Lord. I got saved 30 years ago. Wonderful. Have you followed on to know the Lord since you said you met him? This is about following something. This is about living my life according to a certain standard and a certain pattern, conforming my heart to the will and the word of God. So, first of all, the word followers. If ye be followers, and then the word good. If ye be followers of that which is good. The word translated good in this text is a Greek word that means it's a big concept. It's a huge concept in the Greek language. It means that which is excellent and admirable. It means something that is morally upright and spiritually beneficial. But ultimately this word biblically means God himself and that which is of God. Perhaps you remember this conversation that Jesus had with a man. He's called in the Bible a rich, a rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler who ran to Jesus and fell at his feet. And the Bible says that he said unto Jesus, Good master, good master. That's this word of our text, agathos. Translated good here, same word translated good in Matthew 19, verse 16. He said unto Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now you understand Jesus was saying, You can't just call me good if you're not willing to call me God because the only one who deserves to bear the title good is God himself. So really, when you say followers of that which is good, you're talking about hungering, thirsting, longing, panting, chasing after God himself. Longing for God himself to so reign in your life that the life you're living now begins to resemble the likeness and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus used this same word, the word of our text, good. He used it to describe the kind of heart condition that makes the most of the Word of God when we hear it. Luke chapter 8, he told about the four different kinds of soil. Remember that? Heart conditions likened to different kinds of soil that a farmer contends with. The stony, the hard soil, the stony ground, the thorny ground. And then he said, then there's the good soil. The good soil that in an honest and good heart, having heard the Word, keep it. And they bring forth fruit with patience. He used it to speak of also the inner character that produces fruit to the glory of God in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So you see now what qualifies us to claim the truth of this text. It is a full-on following of the Lord and of the things of God. It is a wholehearted, hot-hearted intention, a commitment of my entire self, not just to believe on Jesus in order to escape hell in the sweet by and by, but also to seek Jesus and surrender to Jesus in the nasty now and now. To those who fall into that category, those who can fall under the umbrella of the statement followers of that which is good, pursuers hungry to be conformed to that which is godlike and godly and Christ honoring, if I fall under the umbrella of this statement, then I can lay hold to the promise of the Word of God that no one shall be able to harm me. And who is he that will harm you? if ye be followers of that which is good. The word harm is a verb in this text that means to affect you evilly, evilly, to oppress, to embitter you is a good way for this to be translated. Who is able to so affect you in an evil way as to embitter you if ye be followers of that which is good? 
The adjective form of this word, our text is a verb, harm is a verb here. The adjective form of this word is the polar opposite of the word good. They are related to each other as opposites, as antithetical to each other. Followers of that which is good. Who is able to do bad in you if you're a follower of that which is good? Bad and good, these two words are polar opposites at other ends of the spectrum. The point being this, if you are an individual who is personally sold out to chasing as hard as you can after that which is good, which is God himself and God likeness, if you're sold out to chasing good, then nothing and no one can make you turn to the bad. Nothing and no one. Now Tozer, one of my heroes in the Lord, did a wonderful job of defining this spiritual concept of harm as it's intended to be understood in this context. And he said three things. He said, to harm in the sense of this verse means, first of all, to debase in quality, to lower the value of something. Who is able to lower your value if it were possible to take gold and somehow do something to it to reduce it to iron? That would be harming the gold. It would be reducing its value. It would be minimizing its preciousness. And so Tozer said that's one meaning of this word harm here, to minimize your preciousness, to reduce your value. And then he said also it could mean to reduce in dimensions, to reduce capacity, to lessen capacity. For instance, a building, let's take our church building that has the ability apparently from this morning to seat about 155 people <laughs> because we didn't have a skinny inch left this morning and we had 155 people. So we had 155 capacity today. Let's say something happens. Uh, an earthquake comes and shakes the foundation and knocks down half of this thing and when we come back next Sunday, we can only seat 70 people. Well, we've been harmed in the sense that we have lost capacity. We are no longer able to function at the level that we were before, and that has reduced our capacity. And then he said the third idea behind harm is to prevent you from fulfilling your destiny or your appointed task. You've been made in the image of God. He's called you to serve Him in a certain way. A particular kind of ministry or service has been given to you. And who is able to keep you from fulfilling that calling if you're a follower of that which is good? Now, this truth needs to be defended, and that's what I want to do for the second half of this message. First of all, I wanted to do the best I could to define the terminology so that we understand we're not talking about some topwater tadpole church member who's tiptoeing through the tulip spiritually. We're talking about somebody who's got a heart for God. They're following the Lord. They want to be conformed to Christ. It is their great heart's burden that they may be reduced in their humanity, that there may be less of me and more of Jesus. That's what drives them, motivates them. And if that's the kind of person you are, then you can rest assured no one has the ability to lessen your value, to lessen your capacity, or to interfere with you fulfilling your spiritual destiny. Who is he that can harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So let me defend this truth for a moment. The devil and his minions, his physical minions, his physical human tools and instruments, and his spiritual tools and instruments, the demon world, the devil and his servants may be able to hurt me in the sense of causing me discomfort, causing me pain, but they are powerless to harm me as long as I'm following hard after the Lord. Here's what we need to apply as we take our born-again minds and apply them to the matter of this text and allow the Scripture to interpret itself, we think of bodily pain and physical death as harmful to us, able to do us harm. Physical pain and bodily pain and physical death. But when you rightly understand the biblical idea of harm, you begin to realize that no amount of physical suffering and hurt can actually damage or diminish us spiritually unless we allow it to by becoming an occasion for sin, by awakening bitterness in our heart, or causing us to become self-centered and distracted from the Lord. I want you to look at the context of my text verse. Back in verse 8 of 1 Peter 3. Verse 8 says... Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, 
be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But... And if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now, the truth is that the only one who can really harm me is me. People can do me wrong, but as long as I respond rightly to them, they haven't harmed me. Now, they may hurt me, and I may lose sleep over it, and I may shed tears over it. They can hurt me, but they cannot harm me unless I choose to respond to them in sin and in the flesh. As long as I keep my eyes on Christ and I respond in a godly and a biblical way, nothing they do can touch my spirituality. They can't diminish my value in the eyes of God. They can't diminish my capacity to know and love the Lord. They cannot diminish and prevent my ability to fulfill the call of God in my life. Who is he that can harm you? Now, now let's be honest. Do you, find, do you find yourself harboring a mental reservation in regards to this text? Do you find yourself saying, no, the, the devil, the devil and devil-controlled people can slander me, preacher, and have. They can insult me and have. They can persecute me and, and, and push comes to shove. They could kill me. Christians are dying all over the world for the sake of the gospel. Surely that qualifies as doing me harm. But I submit to you that that's an unchristian view of things. Our problem is that we don't always think spiritually. We can all too easily get caught up in a worldly worldview rather than a biblical worldview. And let me give you just a glimpse of the biblical worldview. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10, Jesus said, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Hebrews chapter 11 tells of many exploits for the Lord of course. The Hebrews 11 chapter is known as the faith chapter one after another is celebrated for their lives of faith and the choices that they made based on faith, beginning with Abel and going right down the list. And when you come to the last verses of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you have some summation verses. And it talks about those who subdued kingdoms and, and those who saw great victories won and saw dead people raised to life again. Wonderful, exciting, dramatic things happen. And right in the middle of this paragraph in Hebrews 11, then the shift comes and others were tortured not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith. You see, all of that happened to them. Great suffering. But did it harm them? It hurt them, I grant you. But it didn't harm them as long as they kept their eyes of faith on the living God. And
continued to pursue him. Luke chapter 12, I say unto you, my friends, Jesus said this, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of him that killed the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now, of course, that's the big message. It's God who deserves our deep reverence and our wholehearted love and commitment. It's God that should be feared. But the fact is, the Lord Jesus said, you don't need to worry yourself about people that cannot go beyond killing your body. If that's as far as they can go, they can't do you any damage. Now, there's one who can do you damage, that after the body's dead, he can put you in hell. That's the one you need to be concerned about. That's the one you need to keep your eyes on. Think about how this truth is illustrated in some of the people of the Bible. I mentioned Abel a moment ago from Hebrews 11. Remember Abel's story? Abel brought a sacrifice pleasing to God out of the flock. His brother Cain brought the works of his hands. It's the first conflict, the first clash between salvation by grace and salvation by works. The, intercession, the intercessory blood of the Lamb was brought by Abel, which of course was forewarning, forepicturing the coming of Christ himself. Cain brought the fruit of the ground that he labored in, the sweat and the toil, salvation by works. God received the sacrifice of Abel, rejected the sacrifice of Cain. And one day Cain ran upon his brother out in a lonely place in the woods. And whatever his intentions were, when it was all said and done, Abel was dead. You'd say, man, Cain harmed him. No, Cain killed him. He hurt him, but he couldn't do anything to him spiritually. When Abel stepped off of planet earth into the presence of God, he went before the one who had received that sacrifice he brought him. He hadn't been diminished in his value. He hadn't been lessened in his spiritual capacity. He hadn't been prevented from being a God-honoring and sold-out follower of the Lord God himself. Cain could kill his body, but he couldn't stop him from loving God and staying true to him. What about Stephen, the first, one of the first deacons? Stephen got to preaching one day. And the Holy Ghost of God fell on him. And the Bible says that the people cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. Brother, that doesn't sound so bad when you read over it like that. That means they took big rocks and they beat him to death with them. He was beaten to death with rocks. Well, they hurt him. There was pain involved, but they didn't harm him. The Bible says as he died, he said, I see heaven opened. And I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Well, think about Paul's confession. Paul had a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him. He said, stabbed him to the heart. He suffered so terribly. He prayed, oh God, take this away. I don't think I can stand this. Take this thorn in the flesh away. He prayed about it three times and the Lord sent him this word. The Lord said, I'm not going to remove it. You've got to have this to be what I want you to be. Because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And when he understood that, Paul said, well, I'm going to glory then in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The devil was hurting him. Certainly he was hurting, but he hadn't been harmed any, had he? Peter himself, the man who wrote this passage, he learned this lesson. Peter was the one who was full of confidence, who said to Jesus, all the rest of these 12 disciples may run away when they come to arrest you, but I'm telling you one thing, I'll stand. If I have to die by your side, I will stay. And of course, Jesus said to him, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you, and when you are converted, <laughs> strengthen the brethren. Now the devil hurt Peter. He hurt him bad. Peter's the guy who wound up going out in the woods weeping his heart out when he denied three times that he'd ever heard the name of Jesus. And that rooster crowed and he remembered what Christ had said. And this big strong man who was so confident in his humanity and his manhood and in his commitment to Christ, this big muscle man, he found himself reduced to nothing in his failure. And he went out in the woods and the Bible says he wept bitterly. And I know he must have thought, this is the end of me. The devil has destroyed me. He's harmed me deeply. But the fact is the devil hadn't harmed him at all. The devil did the one thing for him he needed most. He needed his arrogance reduced to humility so that God could fill him on the day of Pentecost and preach 3,000 souls into the kingdom. He hadn't been harmed. He'd been hurt, but he hadn't been harmed. You understand the difference tonight, beloved? Some of you say, I'm hurting. Man, I'm hurting. 
I'm being harmed, preacher. Not if you're a follower of that which is good, you're not. Now, if you, if you stop following that which is good and you get your eyes on the world and on immediate circumstances and you get bitter and you begin to get in the flesh and make everything about you, yes, you can be harmed. But as long as you're a follower of that which is good, you may hurt, but you will not be harmed. It's impossible for you to be harmed. And, of course, the, the perfect instance is our Savior himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus knew the hurt of disrespect by his hometown crowd. He came to minister in the area where he was from, where he'd been raised. And they began to whisper and say, isn't this Mary's boy? Isn't this Joseph's son? And the Bible says he did not bear many mighty works because of their unbelief. He knew what it was like. He knew the disrespect and the pain of that. He knew the insult and the mockery and the slander of the religious cartel who basically said, well, the only reason he can do anything at all is he's full of the devil. He's Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That's why he has power over the demons. Imagine, they call the king of glory Beelzebub. He knew what it was to be unjustly arrested and brutalized by the malice of men until his physical body had been mutilated beyond recognition. Isaiah 52, 14 says he didn't even look human. And then, of course, nailed to a cross until he died. They hurt him. It hurt. But they could not harm him. He died just as perfect and pure as he lived. And nothing stopped that. Nothing kept him from accomplishing the purpose of God. In fact, the more they tried to harm him, the more they sped along the purposes of God because it was by God's foreknowledge and foreordination that Christ came into the world to go through that suffering right up to the cross. In every case, Though they were hurt physically and even emotionally, they were not harmed internally and spiritually. And the fact is, folk, if I will keep my eyes on the prize, if I will keep my heart in hot pursuit of a closer walk with God, nothing and no one can harm me. Now, that may not do anything for you, but I'm going to tell you I'm thankful for that truth. I'm thankful. First, first, verse 13 through 15 says this in the Bible in basic English. Who will do you any damage if you keep your minds fixed on what is good. But you are happy if you undergo pain because of righteousness. Have no part in their fear and do not be troubled, but give honor to Christ in your hearts as your Lord. The devil and his demons may hate me and attack me. Human beings may falsely accuse me, even physically assault me, even put my body to death, but they cannot harm me. They cannot diminish my worth in the eyes of God. They cannot stop me from worshiping and serving Him. They cannot take me out from under the blood of Jesus. They cannot erase my name from the Lamb's book of life. They cannot invalidate my Savior's promise in John 10. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And they can't stop the sovereign work of God in my life which says all things work together for good that the, them that love God and are the called according to his purpose which calls Paul to say if God be for us who can be against us and I'll tell you something folk not only can they not do any of those things neither can the devil and his demons nor demonized people they cannot force me to get in the flesh and make a spiritual fool of myself unless I choose to let them that's something I have to choose to do. Otherwise, they cannot harm me in any way or in any regard. Dennis Jernigan wrote and recorded one of the most beautiful gospel songs I've heard in all of my years of listening to gospel music. The title of the song is, If I Could Just Sit With You a While. And this is what the chorus says. If I could just sit with you a while, if you could just hold me, nothing could touch me. Though I'm wounded, though I die. Now think about that. You say, well, if you're wounded and you die, isn't something touching you? No, not so long as I'm in the arms of Jesus. Because the fact is, when you do die, what you've just done is arrived at the place you spent your whole life chasing after. At the feet of the Most High God. I know this is a long time ago. Some of you are not old enough even to remember it happening. But some of you do remember one of the first, which unfortunately has become the first of many such tragedies in America, the Columbine shooting. Remember the famous young lady who was killed after answering the question, do you believe in God? And she said, I do. And he shot her and killed her. 
I was in a Bible conference with a dear man of God who referenced that event, and he made this statement. He said, he said that God-hater, that God-hating young man with that gun in his hand said of this girl, do you believe in God? And his response, if you remember, he said, why? And he shot and killed her. He said, that young man put that gun to her head and said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. And he said, why? And pulled the trigger and blew her straight into the arms of Jesus. And he said a few minutes later, he put that gun to his own head and he got the answer to the question, why? When he faced that God himself to give an account. I'm telling you, folk, though I'm wounded, though I die, just so long as I'm in the arms of Jesus, nothing can touch me. And who is he that will harm you? Certainly, obviously, I can be hurt. My feelings can be hurt. My reputation can be hurt. My physical body can be made to feel pain and eventually will lie down and die. But glory to God, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, Though our outer man perishes, our inner man is renewed day by day. While these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You know tonight that the afflictions that you go through in this world are not working against you, they're working for you. They're not harming you, they're helping you. And listen to how the great, beautiful Psalm 91 puts it. And I close with this tonight. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fountain. Now listen, interpret this spiritually. Interpret this in light of what we've been studying. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. And I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, your only concern tonight need be that ye be followers of that which is good. You make that your business. Everything else falls under the province of God. And I can promise you he'll keep his end of the situation. Would you pray with me this evening? Father, I bless and praise you. I thank you for the truth of this text and the encouragement that it is to my heart. I live in a world that is fallen and a world that is full of hurt. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, the Bible says. Trouble is all around us and hurt is all around us. Many of us live with it every day of our lives, pain of one kind or another. But in the midst of the pain, it need not be spiritually damaging to us. It need not be harm unless we choose to let it be. And so God help us to sell our souls to be followers of that which is good. And knowing that if we do so, we can rest ourselves in the arms of our Savior. Though we're wounded, though we die, nothing can touch us in the arms of our dear Savior. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this evening? Brother Jeremy is going to lead us in a verse or two of invitation. If the Holy Ghost has said something to you that you need to respond to tonight, you be obedient to him while we...